kids. It's Miss Cindy here again for our sixth week of Sunday School online, but hopefully we'll be able to meet back in our classrooms very soon. Well, six weeks ago, I gave an uh, Easter lesson on how Jesus paid the punishment for our sins through his death on the cross, his burial, and his glorious resurrection from the tomb. The second week, Miss Anna taught on creation and Adam and Eve and how sin first came into the world and why we need a Savior. Third week, Miss Christie showed us how to grow as a Christian once we are saved um, through prayer, Bible reading, giving, church attendance, and witnessing. The fourth week, Mr. Brandon showed, told us about a woman who used up her most precious possession, a very expensive alabaster box of ointment, to show her love for Jesus. And last week, Pastor Josh showed us how Jesus used just a little boy's lunch to do a great miracle for over 5,000 people. Now, you might be thinking, but I'm just a kid. I don't have a job to be able to give money to the offering. Or maybe you're a preschooler, and you think, I can't even read. How can I study the Bible? Or maybe you're in kindergarten through third grade, and you say, I don't have any box of expensive perfume to give to show my love to Jesus. Or maybe as a fourth through sixth grader, you're thinking, well, right now with this pandemic, we can't even meet together in church. I can't invite any of my friends to Sunday school or Awanas. Maybe you're all tend to think, what can I do? Does Jesus even care about me? Well, today I am very happy to tell you that yes, Jesus certainly does. And I'm going to share a lesson with you to show you just how much he does care. In the Bible, Gospels, that's as we know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read that Jesus spent much of his earthly ministry teaching and preaching and healing, and that as he became known, everywhere he went, people, crowds of people from the villages and towns would flock to follow him. In these groups of people, though, it wasn't just men and women but there were children of all ages. They loved watching and listening to him, and I'm sure that they could recognize the kindness and care that he had for all people. One day, as he taught, some mothers brought their young children to him that he might touch them and pray for them. When the disciples saw them coming, though, they rebuked the parents and tried to send them away. The master is too tired and too busy with important things to be bothered with children was their attitude. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was not pleased with this. Let the children come unto me and forbid them not, Jesus commanded, for the kingdom of heaven is made up of those, just those kind of people who trust me like little children do. Then Mark 10, 16 says that he took them up in his arms and he blessed them. So we see that Jesus does care for children very much. And I've got two pictures here. We know, of course, there were no cameras back then to know what Jesus really looked like. But many artists have painted pictures of what, um, here's two that I love of Jesus with children. And I love the looks on his face, um, how it just shows his compassion and his tender love for the children. Now, another time, Jesus' disciples asked him who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, some of them might have thought, well, Peter, because he was the leader of the group, or some maybe thought John. But Jesus surprised them all by calling a little child to him, come to him from the crowd, and stand where he could be seen. Then he taught a very important lesson, which we find in Matthew chapter 18. Truly I tell you all that anyone who will not come to God in childlike faith will never be allowed in God's kingdom or his family. But whoever will humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now he said being humble. What does that mean? Well, to be humble means to admit that we're not good enough or smart enough or powerful enough to work out our own life, but knowing that God is all um, good and all smart and all powerful and by simply coming to him in trust and belief as a little child trust is what will please him. This again shows how much Jesus values children. Now you may be thinking, okay, 
Jesus loves me, but, you know, I'm still a child, so it doesn't really matter how I behave, right? Wrong. Proverbs 20, 11 says, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. God watches everything you do, he hears everything you say, and he even knows everything you think. And he is just as interested in how a child behaves as he is in how a grown-up behaves. Because he loves you so much and gave his earthly life for you, honoring and pleasing him should be the greatest desire of, well, all of us. Jesus further explained to the disciples why they should let children come to him as well as adults. It's because we are all sinners. In uh, Miss Anna's lesson, she learned, uh, taught us that Adam and Eve committed the first sin when they disobeyed God, and every person born after that inherited Adam's sin nature. And since we are all the great, 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 oh, great grandchildren of Adam, we are all lost in sin and cannot save ourselves. But Jesus said in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now to illustrate this, Jesus gave a parable. And what's a parable? That's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. To show just how important seeking the lost is to him. He told of a shepherd who had a flock of 100 sheep. How many? 100. Now this was a very good shepherd who loved and knew all his sheep by name, he kept them safe in the fold at night, and he took them out every morning to the best green pastures and cool water for them. Now, sheep cannot see very far ahead, and they don't have that great eyesight. And so, on their own, they could easily slip on a rock and fall down a ravine, or maybe step into a grass-covered hole and break a leg. So, the shepherd carefully guided them along the paths that he knew was safest. He also protected them from any dangerous enemies like a lion or a bear that sometimes would hide in the bushes along the trails just ready to pounce on a, a little weak lamb or a straying sheep. If that happened, the watchful shepherd would just quickly take a sharp stone out of his uh, bag and put it in his slingshot and whoo, whirl it right at and kill the lion or the bear or the attacking beast. But sometimes there would be an adventurous lamb who wanted to explore or a rebellious sheep who did not want to mind, which would wander off and of course they would get lost because it's a fact that sheep are not the smartest animal. And sometimes that reminds us of us, doesn't it? Well, that night when the shepherd counted his sheep like he did every night, bringing them back into the fold, he was counting 97, 98, 99, 99. Where's the hundredth one? There was one missing. Oh, one must have wandered off when he wasn't looking. Well, did he think, oh well, I still have 99, that's enough. No, he did not. He, each sheep was special and loved by the shepherd. So he quickly called over another shepherd to uh, kind of watch over his flock for, for him, and he ran off to seek that one that was lost. This good shepherd searched very bravely for as long as it took, climbing over muddy rocks and, and trudging through thorny bushes and rough rugged hills, all the while calling out the little sheep's name. Finally, he heard a sad little, bah! And there, over a drop-off, he saw that poor little sheep who had slipped off down onto a small ledge and had no way to rescue himself. If he didn't get help, he was going to perish. But in a soothing voice, the shepherd spoke comforting words to the frightened animal. It's okay. Don't be afraid. I'm here. I've got you. And while he reached down and pulled it securely up into his arms, as he, um, then he hoisted it up around his shoulders, that's the way they carried sheep, onto his strong shoulders, and he headed toward home. As he approached, the shepherd called out to his friends that he had found and brought his sheep back safely. 
and they all rejoiced with him. Now the Bible tells us in Luke 15, 10, that there is even rejoicing in heaven when a lost person gets saved. Now does this shepherd remind you of anybody? Hmm, yes, it's Jesus. And do the wandering lambs or the selfish sheep remind you of anybody else? Yeah, it's sometimes us when we think we can handle things our own way without needing God. But you know Jesus loves us way too much to give up without seeking us. And he calls out our names to him, come to him. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants every person to receive him as their own savior and then follow him faithfully. Christians are God's sheep who have been saved into his family. So we could say that when a child gets saved, he's like a little lamb that's now in God's family, who now has a whole life to live for Jesus, who is the true good shepherd. Now before we close, let me share with you one more example of Jesus' concern for children, which we find this account in three of the Gospels. Jesus was in a city one day when a tearful ruler of the synagogue named Jairus came running up to him and fell down at his feet. Oh, please, Master, my only little daughter is lying at the point of death. Please come and heal her. Well, Jesus agreed, and they um, arrived at the man's home only to find a lot of people wringing their hands and crying, Oh, the little girl's dead, they wailed. Oh, the little girl's dead. But Jesus tried to calm them down, and he said, No, she's not dead. She's just only sleeping. But they laughed him to scorn. They made fun of him because they knew she was dead, and she really was. But Jesus knew what he was going to do. In love and compassion, he took the girl's parents, and the Bible says three of his disciples, into her room and tenderly spoke to her. You know what he said? Little girl, arise. And wow, immediately the girl, the daughter of the parents began to breathe and she sat up and looked like she'd never been sick. The parents were overjoyed. Oh, they were just so thrilled that their much loved only daughter was well. And Jesus had brought the child back to life. Well, you know, Jesus does love everyone. He loves men, women, boys and girls, old people, adults, teenagers, and children. Let me show you a picture. This is more of a modern day time picture where Jesus is with children of all ages but all nationalities and ethnicities. Because, you know, Jesus doesn't just love Americans or Israeli Jews or people in Africa. He loves people and children in every country and every time uh, since the world began and he loves you, and he loves me. And then there's a verse in Revelation 3.20 that says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, what exactly does that mean? He's not speaking of the door to your house, or to the church, or to the school or even the door to your room. He's talking about the door to your heart. He's saying that if you will believe in him and open your heart for him to save you, he will come into your life, forgive you, and be with you always. Just like he raised the little girl physically, he will raise you spiritually, which means he will give you a brand new life that will live forever in heaven with him and you'll be able to have wonderful fellowship with him here in this life now and for in eternity forever. But you notice there's no doorknob on this door? Hmm, most doors have doorknobs, but not this one because you see, Jesus will not force his way in. He could because he can do everything, but his plan is that he will not force his way, but he waits for you to invite him in. Now, he has done everything necessary to save you, but he wants you to want him. If you've never done that and you want to, 
you could pray and do that today. He's just waiting for to hear from you. And if you already are a child of God, you could pray that he will help you throughout your life to grow into the best person that you can be for him and that you would serve him all your life. Thank you for being with us today, and let's close now in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this lesson. I thank you for uh, your word that you've recorded for us so that we can know the things that you think and feel and what you want us to do and not do and and apply the, the things that happened in the past to our lives now. I pray if there's any child that's uh, listening to me now, if you've touched their hearts, that they would accept you as their Savior, or if they are a Christian, that they would determine to be more loving and more um, like Christ-like as they grow. And Father, if there happens to be a grown-up that's listening and maybe they're not exactly right with you, you love everybody, not just children. And your will is for all of us to be what you want us to be for your glory and our good. Lord, I thank you for this time that we've had today, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, kids, I hope that we can see you real soon. Bye. Well, good afternoon. It's hard to say that when I'm going to be speaking in Sunday school. But uh, what a privilege it is to stand before an empty auditorium, and except for my daughter, it's the only one here, and Josh, who's running the camera. That's frightening. And um, But uh, what a privilege to be able to stand and open the Word of God and know that there's folks out there that are, that are tuning in. Now, that's an old-fashioned, that's old-school phrase for, for joining us by YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're joining us from, and... and uh, Uh, It's a privilege to be able to stand and to open the Word of God and teach from it this afternoon. And um, what a blessing. What a weird time. I almost said it's so so good not to see anybody. And that's kind of a weird statement, but we live in a weird time. I heard uh, Brother Jason Perlock say uh, at the beginning of this, as he came up to his first Sunday with with no church, no in-person church, he said, never in my life have I had so many decisions on where not to attend church. <laughs> and he meant that he could watch it by live stream and, and uh, on the internet. And, and uh, what a blessing in this weird time that we live that we can come together in this way. And um, uh, it's a real, real blessing that God allows us to do that. And we can use technology for something so wonderful as spreading the Word of God around the world. It has been interesting to, to look in on other churches and friends around the country, around the world, and watch their services and catch up with them a little bit. And uh, it looks like that uh, we'll get together real soon. And um, looking forward to that. In your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We live in a time that... Uh, I believe took us from by surprise. It seemed like one day we were uh, we were just uh, living life and going to work, going to school, and in a matter of days, a generational event happened that took us by surprise, and uh, all of us, and changed our world for the for the temporary, anyhow, for the for the time being, and. Uh, uh, many things have happened, and many people have questions. And I want to just spend the next half hour or so looking at, at not the elephant in the room, but what is on the hearts of many people. When this first happened and when, when things were going on around the world, people asked, is this the, is this the last days? Well, I believe the last days started 2,000 years ago when Jesus ascended into heaven and said he was coming back. And that started this church age that, that we live in. I do believe we live in the last of the last days. Jesus mentioned that he was coming back, so he is coming back. I believe the same before this pandemic as I do during the pandemic, as I will after the pandemic, because the Bible clearly teaches us some things. I, I, I did hear a tremendous message, and I believe God led me that, to, to listen to the message on Matthew chapter 24, Jesus 
preaches, a, a, of course, the, the, the greatest preacher ever lived. Jesus teaches on the end time. And a lot of Matthew chapter 24 sounds like the headlines off our newspaper. But in the context of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the end of the tribulation period, the seven-year period. Now, uh, it, was, it was a tremendous message in that it brought it back to an application that we live in the foreshadow of that time. We don't, as Christian people, we're not to look for signs. The Jews look for signs. Uh, what, what we're told in Scripture is to watch and be ready. To watch and be ready. Um, the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church is the next thing on the prophetic calendar. And it will come without any warning. There's no prophetic timetable left that that has to be fulfilled for the rapture of the church. Only the Father knows when that will be. And I believe, personally, it'll, it'll be soon. I believe that before the pandemic. I believe it now, and I believe it after the pandemic. I believe Jesus could come back at any time. And uh, Matthew 24 gives us a... We, we, we're living in a day that mirrors that time. Um, it mirrors that. And somebody made this illustration... They said that um, uh, that it's, it's, it's sort of like Christmas and Thanksgiving. When you get into the fall of the year, uh, Christmas time, the, there's signs. The stores put up Christmas trees about September. There's all kinds of, of signs of Christmas. Things are going on. The, the, the the same Christmas shows are shown on the Hallmark Channel continuously that just have different titles. It's the same movie. It's the same story. It always ends the same way. But that's all pointing toward Christmas. But there's a great event about a month before Christmas that don't get much press. And that's Thanksgiving. But once you see the signs for Christmas, you know that Thanksgiving's right around the corner because it's going to become before that. And I believe that's a, a great illustration of what we're experiencing today in nature, um, in our world, in a falling away of the church and the faithful. I believe we see these things that are foreshadows of what's going to happen. Now the church will be gone. Uh, the rapture of the church will, will take place and and this world hasn't seen anything yet. That wrath will be poured out upon the earth during their seven-year period before the Lord actually returns and puts His feet on the Mount of Olives and comes back that second time. So is there, is there Scripture that addresses today? Yes, there is. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. And it's Paul talking to his, his, his preacher boy, his son in the faith, and he's, he's talking about the end days. Now, if Paul is addressing the perilous days of the last days 2,000 years ago, how much closer are we today? And I believe it is very uh, applicable to today. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We live in perilous days. What a description. That word perilous means dangerous and savage and hard to deal with. Um, but we live in perilous days. And then there's this, this description of the day in which we live. Um, this day in which we live. And this is all things to turn away from. I like to look at, at, at negative parts of Scripture uh, such as this that tells us to, to, from these things turn away is what we'll read in the verse in a minute. And then I realize that if you take the opposite of every one of these, that's the way we should live. <laughs> it's the characteristics of the Christian life in reverse. Uh, it's a great way to look at, the, at this list, but it, it says, period of time shall come. Verse two says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, 
traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. I want to look at this, and I really want to hurry a little bit on this front end of this chapter because I want to get to the, the remedy for the last days. So how do we live in these last days? A great Christian philosopher years ago, he's been in heaven a long time, Francis Schaeffer did a whole series on, on civilizations, and he studied civiliza- civilizations, and he looked at, at, at Christianity, and he came up with this question, how then shall we live? So that's the question for the day. We know what's going on around us. Uh, we see it on the news. We wait for the governor to speak. We wait for the president to speak. We see what's going on. We, we, we know there's people living in heartache. We know there's sick folks. We know there's a virus there. We know there's other great calamities going on around the world. We understand that. But the question is, how then shall we live? So let's look at these characteristics and then let's get to the Bible fix for today. Number one, we we see some things we have to turn away from. How are we going to live? We're going to repeal some things. We're going to repel some things, I'm sorry. And we're going to turn away from them. In this verse, in in verse 5, it says, from such turn away. Well, what are we turning away from? In verse 2, it says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. We know that. Um, This prideful, selfish generation that we live in. God help us. Unfortunately, as as a young preacher, I preached these things and these descriptions were more descriptions of the world in which we live. But unfortunately, the longer I live, the more these descriptions of the church in which we live. It's not a good thing. We should turn away from these things. They should have no part of a Christian's life Lovers of their own selves. The Bible also says, covetous, always wanting, boasters, proud. That word proud is the, it has a spirit of arrogance. Uh, looking out for number one. Uh, the, the happiness in the Christian life is others, putting our attention and our focus upon others first. And living our life in the service of others. That's true Christianity and true happiness in the Christian life. To live for others. Heard a preacher say over and over and over again, and I cringed every time. He said, a poor dog wouldn't, a poor dog that don't wag its own tail. That's a cute little saying. But it's not biblical. (laughs) Book of Proverbs says, let other men's lips praise thee. We're supposed to have a humble attitude. We're supposed to serve others, not looking for the attention of men and understanding that God understands what we're doing and the motive for what we're doing. And we serve Him as we serve others. I think it's important in these days that we live. And I believe the world sees the difference. Let me hurry. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, given to bitter words. They blaspheme God. Disobedient to parents. We live in that day where children rule their homes and it shouldn't be. God gave His children to raise and not worship. And our children should be, diso- or should be obedient to parents. That's God's plan. Um, and we live in a day where that's not the case. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. We live in a Christian world or a Christian time of of not holiness. I'm not sure we even understand the word anymore. Uh, We've taken out holiness from the church and replaced it with performance. It shouldn't be. God is not my buddy. Jesus Christ is not some cool surfer dude. My wife and I went to a performance in, in an in a, a, a entertainment town. I won't say which one. And as soon as we got there, there was all these advertisements for this 
play. It's not sight and sound, by the way, but there's play about Jesus. And we thought, we had just been to sight and sound theaters and they do a great job. And, and we thought, okay, let's go see this. And so we went to see it and halfway through it, Jesus had come out and honestly, Jesus should have been on a skateboard. He really should have been. He, they, they had him so worldly that it was sickening, completely unholy. And we serve and worship a thrice holy God. And he told us to be holy as he's holy. And I'm, I think we've just abandoned that today. We don't even understand that anymore. We live in an unholy world. My wife and I left halfway through and the guy at the door asked, asked me why we were leaving. And I said, well, I, I, I've been here half the play and my favorite character is the devil. It's time to go home. <laughs> he laughed. Um, unholy. Without natural affection. I could stay there for three days. We live in a world that don't know which bathroom to use and screaming for rights for people that are confused without natural affection. We live in a world that's murdered six, 60 million babies in the womb. That's without natural affection. Truce breakers. People that can't be trusted. False accusers. Incontinence without self-control, without self-discipline. Fierce despisers of those that are good. If you want to be despised in this world, do something good. It used to be even the world would respect the church and Christians and godly people, but that's changed in our world. Now we're held in great derision. We live in perilous days. We live, I believe, in the last of the last day. The Bible says, having a form of godliness, I'm sorry, I missed one, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. <coughs> turn away from the false. Turn away from the fake. Turn away from the spiritually powerless. Now what do we replace that with? He, he still continues down this world. Now he talks about the description of those that are deceivers. There's many deceivers in the world today. Let me hurry through this for a, in verse uh, 6. For, this, uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with uh, sins, led away with divers' lusts. By the way, I always add there's a bunch of silly men that's led away as well. Chapter verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Always searching, but never coming to the truth of the Word of God. Academic, but powerless. Verse 8, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. There's a payday coming. God's going to judge all and He will set it all straight. And we're thankful for that. Their works will be manifest. And by the way, I believe you can make it manifest today by studying the Word of God and checking everything out by your personal study of the Word of God. Verse 10, But thou hast fully known my, uh, my doctrine. Here's the switch. Here's the turn. All of this, we're in perilous days. Here's some things you should turn away from. Here's the negative. And then Paul says, if you're going to flee some things, here's certain things to follow. Here's what you follow in a true spiritual leader. In verse 10, but thou hast fully known. I like that. One of the buzzwords of the day is transparency. <laughs> we deal in state government with transparency. Hey, your spiritual life should be transparent. 
You shouldn't be fake. You should be real. But others should see your faith lived out before them. Now, it's fully known my doctrine. I think it's so interesting that Paul, when he comes to the remedy, he says, but, but follow after these things. He says, basically, he's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. As I follow the Lord, follow me. Watch, by the way, are you that confident in your testimony? If you'll hold your testimony precious and your walk with the Lord precious, then you won't have concern for those who are following after you as you follow Christ. You fully know my doctrine. I think it's interesting. Paul doesn't say, the first thing he doesn't say, follow after my works. Follow after my lifestyle. Follow after my ability. Follow after my speaking. He says, follow after my doctrine, what I believe. Follow after the doctrine of Scripture. People will let you down. But God's Word will stand. In, in chapter 2, the Bible says, the Word of God is not bound. It goes beyond human weakness. So follow after Doctrine. By the way, do you know what you believe and do you know why you believe it? It's so important in this day of shifting sand. A day that is filled, the airways are filled with false. That we learn the truth to combat the false. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Ground yourself in the faith of the doctrine of the Word of God. It's pretty important. Paul mentioned it first. He said, my manner of life, my purpose, follow after my purpose. Wow. Follow after, you've fully known my faith. You've fully known my long-suffering. You've fully known my charity, my love. You've fully known my patience. Uh -oh. You've fully known my persecution. You've fully known my afflictions. And he lists them which came to me at Antioch, of Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I, I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. I... We live in a, in a world, we live in a country that we have enjoyed freedom and I pray and trust and, and will fight with everything I have to preserve that freedom for us to enjoy and for my children, my grandchildren and their grandchildren to enjoy as the Lord tarries. But we're not guaranteed that we won't suffer persecution. God don't love us more than He did the first century church who suffered great perse persecution. But the faith abounded through it. We might be suffering through a little bit of, of liberty restrictions, I guess. Not in our state. We've done all this voluntarily because our governor uh, exempted us from the beginning. So we've just been careful and done this voluntarily. And I'm thankful for it. But not everybody's been blessed by that. But the persecution which we're, we're seeing across America... And it is a chip away of our religious liberty and we ought to fight it. We ought to prepare and we ought to speak out against it. But it's nothing compared to what other generations have suffered for the cause of Christ. Paul said, I endured him. The Lord delivered me out of it. At the end of all that, God delivered him. By the way, He'll deliver us. In verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You won't see that on a promotion poster. <laughs> if you're going to live godly in this world, in these perilous days, if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to suffer persecution. Yay! The devil hates what God loves about you. And the world, this world system stands against you and never will stand for you. 
So we're going to suffer. If you're going to live, if you're not suffering some persecution for the cause of Christ, you better check up if you're living for the cause of Christ. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're going to get worse. We live in that age. Wake up. I like verse 14. <laughs> now we come to the, the, the correction. How, we live in perilous days, we do. I think we live in the last of the last days. Uh, there's false out there. Turn away from it. Realize there's deceivers. Everything that glitters is not gold. Check it out with the Word of God. And then we get to this wonderful few verses. Verse 14, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Of course, this letter is personal to Timothy, but it is to you and I. Don't quit. Continue in those things that you've been taught. Paul's saying, I've lived this out before you. I haven't been blown around by every doctrine that comes or every fad that comes around. My life's been consistent before you. Now continue in those things. It's a charge. And it's a charge for us in these last perilous days. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been served of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast uh, known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, you just saw a Sunday school lesson for our kids and I, what a blessing to be able to do that every week. Do we believe in child evangelism and winning children to Christ? Yes. Timothy was taught the Scriptures as a child. I was saved as a Boy down on the courthouse lawn of almost seven years old. I've never doubted my salvation there. Why? Because I did exactly what the Bible said and I trusted Christ. And I know what He did in my life. And I know how He's led my life. And I know the witness of the Holy Spirit in my life from that time. We reach children. And then we love this verse. Verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. There's that word again. So we live in perilous days. We're turning away from all that's false. That lifestyle that does not please God and does not benefit the Christian at all and does not edify Christ in the church, turn away from it. Beware of deceivers. Follow after a true Christian leadership and testimony. Stay faithful at it. And then, at the end of this chapter and the beginning of the next chapter, we see the preeminence of God's Word. How do we do it? Through the power of the Word of God. It makes all the difference. This wonderful book. Somebody said if you took the Bible and made the Bible into a person, you would have Jesus Christ. If you took Jesus Christ and made Him into a book, you'd have your Bible. Somebody said this Bible is so alive that if you cut it, it would almost bleed. The Bible is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's probably the most neglected thing. Maybe that in prayer in the life of a Christian. Won't you love the Word of God? Fall in love with the Word of God. Hunger for it. Thirst for it. Give it preeminence in your life. Here it is, profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is what is right. Your Bible is profitable for doctrine, for what is right. 
is profitable for reproof. That's what is wrong. The Bible will point out what's wrong in your life. We don't like to hear it anymore, but the Bible will point out the sin in your life and it'll name it by name. We ought to love it, love the Bible for it. So doctrine for what is right, for reproof for what is wrong. The Bible is profitable for correction. That's how to be right. The Bible corrects our steps, corrects our journey, corrects our paths of life, if you'll let it. So it's for what is right doctrine, for what is wrong reproof, for how to get right, which is correction, and then how to stay right, instruction in righteousness. It instructs us. This is our God. It's our guidebook for living. It's our light along this path, this dark path in this world. What a treasure of the Word of God. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect as complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And in closing, <coughs> excuse me. In closing, I, let me just remind you, this letter was all one big letter. Uh, it's inspired. The, the chapters and verses aren't. They were there for our good and our, uh, the help for us to find things. So continuing in this very thought of the importance and preeminence of God's Word, we move right through into chapter 4, and he continues the thought of the Word of God, and he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Mentions His appearing. He's coming. And we'll give an account of our life. And so He gives us this charge. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. In verse 2. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There's that word again. I think it's probably pretty important what you believe. Preach the word. Give them God's word. It's so important. My opinion don't matter a whole lot, but God's opinion is everything. Preach God's word. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And here's this command again. And they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. Whatever God's got you, given you to do, do it with everything you have. Do it as long as you're here, as long as you have the ability to, to, to perform that, do it. Stay faithful. This pandemic doesn't change anything in the Word of God. It may change our access. It may slow us down as far as this. But I, I'll just submit to you that, that the Bible and the teaching of the Bibles probably went further around the world from pulpits just like this one uh, than it ever has. Now we pray that we'll see revival in our land and we'll see a great harvest in these last days. Revival will come because God's people seek it. And a great harvest will come because God's people revive. What a blessing. Aren't, don't you love the Word of God? I, it means so much. What would we do without it? Where would we be without standing before people and opening it up and saying, thus God said. Get away from the false. Look out for deceivers. Check them out by God's Word. Continue thou in the things that you've been taught doctrine. And then, uh, give the Word of God preeminence in your life. Father, Lord, we thank You for the wonderful privilege of opening up the Word of God. Lord, You've blessed us beyond. I was just looking in my house and I've collected Bibles from those that's gone before me. And, but I, I, I probably saw in one cabinet 15 Bibles. 
You've given us, and that's not like that all around the world. But we're blessed with the ability to get access to God's Word. And Lord, many times it's neglected. We've had more time at home, more time by ourselves, more time uh, uh, to think. And Lord, I, I, I trust we've spent more time in Your Word. Lord, help us in these last days. We look for Your soon return. But until we see you face to face, help us to occupy until you come. Help us to be faithful doing what you've called us to do. Lord, take care of us. We, we, we trust you completely. You've already been to tomorrow and you say everything's okay because you're there. You told us you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And we claim those promises in this day in which we live. And Lord, as we look at the back of the book and we see all that John saw. And Lord, we pray that prayer just as John prayed. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And Lord, bless us until we see each other again. In Jesus' name, and amen.
Good evening once again, and boy, it's good to be able to meet again on a Sunday evening, and I appreciate your faithfulness there. I look forward to the day when we're right back in here, and with that being said, our desire is on next Sunday morning, the 24th, and we'll have some information. Some of you have already got information concerning that. We'll have two simultaneous services, one service in here that'll be for the adults, um, and then a service in the activity building gym that'll be for adults that have children at home. That'll kind of separate the two groups a little bit, and I think that'll be a good way to handle this uh, as we have a refreshed re, uh, return, you might say. And uh, So you pray about that. Pray with us that we'll make the right decisions and as we lay out plans to begin together in this place. I'm looking forward to that. I want to say thank you for those who have given uh, to Bibles for Grads. And you can do that if you haven't yet online, drop that by the office. Also, your faithfulness in giving, tithes and offerings and missionary uh, missions. I was thinking about that the other day. Our missionaries all around the world facing some of the same similar things that we're facing, dependent upon us, the church, to, um, to meet their needs. And I, I thank you for your faithfulness in giving towards that. Uh, I appreciate um, Pastor Kelly and his family. Well, what a blessing they are here in our church. And uh, Pastor Kelly, of course, just taught Sunday school uh, in our, just before the service. But I want him to come, if he would, and, and lead us in prayer for our evening service. Pastor Kelly. Well, it's good to be with you tonight, and I'm going to open in a word of prayer. I want to just say a word to all of our folks and our Sunshine Seniors. I look forward to the time we can be together again and sing crazy songs and eat the best food in the church, and hope you're staying safe, staying home, and uh, see light the tunnel or light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, certainly uh, miss everybody and and uh, look forward to uh, getting this all behind us. And I also want to thank the church for their prayers and the, uh, the home going of my dad and from our family to our church family. We thank you for all that's been done and said and, and um, it's hard to believe we've been through that during this time. And so, but God's been good and we're thankful for it. Well, let's open in a word of prayer tonight. Father, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. You told us to be thankful for all things. And Lord, it's easy to get uh, distracted from that. But you are good to us beyond what we deserve. And Lord, in this life only, if we just had the promise of eternal life through your Son, we could thank you for all of eternity. But you give us more than that. You give us abundant life. And we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how powerful it is. And we pray that you would uh, just be with the, the singing and preaching and reading of your word tonight and that you might bless there in a mighty way. We think of those that are hurting, Lord, those that have lost folks and, and are sick. And I pray that you would just be with them in a special way and meet their needs. We pray for folks that's lost jobs, that you would supply their needs. Lord, many times we say that um, if if God fails you, you'll make world history because you'll be the very first one in history. And Lord, uh, we pray that you would uh, uh, assure us of that and give us comfort in that. Lord, we pray for those that are struggling at home, those that are lonely. I pray that you might uh, be a real friend to them and be close to them and encourage them as only you can. And Lord, help us as a church family to reach out to these folks and uh, we pray for your preaching tonight that you might uh, uh, fill, uh, fill us with your power. Lord, help us to um, respond to the message and help us to say yes if you speak to our heart. We pray for those most of all that are lost without you, that they'll be saved before it's eternally too late. Now, Lord, bless. Lead God direct in everything we do, we pray in Jesus' name and amen.
Years of time have come and gone Since I first heard it told How Jesus would come again Someday If back then it seemed so real Then I just can't help but feel How much closer His coming is today Thank you so much. Well, I tell you, I've always already enjoyed being here. And if you would turn your Bibles to Psalms 84, get your Bibles out. And I'm going to look at a at a passage this evening for a little while and entitled This Special Place. This special place. Now I will say this over the last couple months, other than the one time I recorded in my office. I've been in church. I've been in this place, this particular facility, and been able to preach to a camera um, and uh, envision that there be a place full. And I look forward to that. And that day's coming again soon, Lord willing. But this is a special place. 
And uh, I use that illustration a lot. And this particular psalm speaks of, uh, I believe, this special place. We're going to read Psalms 84. We're just going to look at a few of the verses, but the psalm isn't that lengthy. Um, There's only 12 verses, so I'm going to read Psalms 84, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer, okay? It says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out, for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. And I understand this is a psalm uh, of the tabernacle, you might say, and, and the psalmist in this situation. There are several applications you could make, and I understand um, that, that uh, the house of God's in heaven and the true tabernacle now is the heart of the believer, but I believe the church is a symbol, a visible symbol of these things, and that's the application that I want to take as we look at this this evening. When the saints gather themselves together in this place and worship Almighty God. I look forward to that. Um, This is a place that's set aside. I mean, this building, we don't worship this building, but this place is set aside for the worship of of the Lord God Almighty. And I, I'm glad I'm able to preach from here, and I can't wait till we're all assembled back in this place. I look forward to that. Well, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us as we look at this passage of Scripture. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this evening. Another good day you've given us. You get all the glory. And Lord, as we speak on this subject about this special place and about this church and Lord, uh, just the application of the actual facility. Lord, may you be in this and help me to say only what you once said. May it encourage hearts and convict us and help us to realize the value of what you've established. And Lord, we'll sure thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank the Lord. I read a poem I thought was interesting. It says, How lovely is thy dwelling place. O Lord of hosts to me, the tabernacle of thy grace, how pleasant, Lord, they be. My thirsty soul longs vehemently, yea, faints thy courts to see. My very heart and flesh cry out, O living God, for thee. You know, truly, if we're saved, we're going to love, we're going to enjoy and want to be in that place where God's people gather to worship in the presence of the Lord. You think about that. I want to look at a few thoughts that we draw from this uh, passage of Scripture that I hope will be a blessing. I hope it will help you. The first thing I notice in this passage is it inspires a delight. Think about this. The psalmist describes the house of God. Look what it says there in verse 1, how amiable are thy tabernacles. That word amiable means worthy to be loved. How worthy to be loved are thy tabernacles. God's people ought to love the church. Now, I'm not talking about the building. Let me clarify that. I'm talking about 
together as a body of believers, we ought to love and desire to be in this place. There's a couple good ways that you can show your love for the church. The one, and we know this and probably get tired of hearing preachers preach it all over the world, but it's the first one is to be present. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We ought to be more desirous even to be together as God's people. I like what it says in Psalms 40 and verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, the law was within my heart. So we ought to be present present in the house of God. Now, secondly, I notice we ought to be pleasant. Psalms 122 and verse 1. It says, the song of degrees of David is, is the inscription before that. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I got to tell you, as a child, there were some days I wasn't glad when they said we were going to the house of the Lord. But I tell you what, Christ saved me and he changed that to a glad. And uh, he, he gave a, a, a pleasant desire to be amongst God's people. You know, the reason I love the church, or there's, there's many different things I can say about that, but if I named a few, I find hope here. I find hope. Hey, you, you look around and you see the lives that have been transformed by the grace of God. Hey, that gives me hope. Hey, I get help here. I get encouragement. Um, my friends are here. Those that, that I'm in a relationship with uh, spiritually, this is where they dwell and congregate together. The fellowship is here. Our friendship, our companionship, we plow together. Those are things that I love about the church. I find understanding here. We go through the same things. We have the same struggles. And we can understand that. And we worship in this place. I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to stay away from this place. Boy, we're in a difficult time right now where we're not in this place. And I, that'll change real soon. I, I love preaching from the porch just to be able to come around this place. You know, I find the things I need here for my journey in the Christian life. This is a wonderful place. It's a good place. I love the church this evening. Let me ask you, do you love the church this evening? Hey, it'll inspire a delight within you. It's pleasing. It's exciting. It's encouraging this place that God's given us. The church. Something else I notice in verse 2 and also in verse 10, it inspires a desire. Think about that. <laughs> the psalmist is telling us that his whole being longed to be in the house of God. His soul, his body, and his heart longed to be in that place of worship. Wow. Maybe the psalmist remembered what many saints have forgotten. I, I don't know. Perhaps he remembered that um, the, the church and the tabernacle was um, an oasis. I don't know about you, but it gets a little difficult out there, and I'm glad I can come into this place and see some smiling faces and have some folks that encourage you and shake your hand and you feel like they're glad to see you. Hey, this is a good place. It inspires a desire um, and in, in our lives, the house of God. You know, I, all through um, David's life, I notice he uh, longed for and had a desire to be in the house of the Lord. Psalms 27 and, and verse 4 says this, One thing have I desired... Of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See that desire? 
But one thing I have desired of the Lord. First Chronicles 29.3 Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. It inspires a desire. Is your affection set on the house of God? Do you look forward to coming to church? Let's just put it plain and simple. Do you look forward to, do you have a desire to come to this place? We're getting comfortable not being in church. That concerns me. Oh, that we'd have a desire to be in the house of God. The whole idea from his experience is that the psalmist was a man that loved the house of the Lord and longed for it when he couldn't be there. You know, sadly, we live in a day and age where so many people, even professing Christians, see church as something they can take or leave. I, I, I know what I'm saying is not popular. I understand that. But we've gotten to that place where we think it's just take it or leave it. And we need to understand this evening that the desire of the heart reveal the condition of the soul. The, did you get that? The desire of the heart reveals the condition of the soul. Oh, we don't like to hear that. Preacher, you're stepping on my toes. That's truth. That's the truth. What you long for in life reveals what you love, and what you love reveals who you are. Hmm. There's a good reason why the children of God should long for the Father's house. Yeah, it's a place you meet God. Um, I like it says in Matthew 20, 8, 20. It's a place uh, where, as far as children, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Thank the Lord for children and teaching. You know, uh, I think about one instance of Thomas. Remember the time when Thomas missed out because he wasn't there? I read this. Uh, one of the old Puritan writers was, uh, had observed some things, and he said it like this. He said, the desires of the heart are the best proofs for salvation. If a man wishes to know whether or not he is really a child of God, he can soon find out by putting his finger on the pulse of his desires. For we cannot counterfeit our longings. We can counterfeit the things we say, we can easily pick up a smattering of the language of Canaan and say the right things. We can counterfeit the things that we do. A good action can be done out of a sense of discipline or duty without our hearts being in it at all. But we cannot counterfeit the things we want. It inspires desire. The more I'm here, the more I want to be. And when I'm not here, something's missing. It just, it's just not right. It's not a comfortable place when I'm not here. It inspires delight. It inspires desire. Something else I noticed in this passage this evening is it inspires devotion. Um... The psalmist thought about the Lord's house and about how far away from it he was, and he began to reflect on some things concerning it. L look what he says um, in verse 2. I mentioned my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And he goes on to say in verse 3, Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of thy host, my King and my God. Now, he uses the illustration 
of, uh, of, of two different birds here. He mentions uh, the, the sparrow. He mentions the swallow. And as I think about that, the sparrow it would be considered a worthless bird. And the swallow would be considered a wandering bird. Worthless and wandering. The psalmist says that um, both the worthless and the wandering found exactly what they needed in the house of God. But we can learn a lesson from that. The worthless and the wandering can find exactly what they need in the house of God. You know, I've noticed this and I mentioned it often. It's, it amazes me when folks have struggles and temptations and problems in their life, in their home and whatever. The first thing they begin to stop, the first thing they begin to miss is attending the house of God. And that's the very place we need to be. The very place we can be fed and be encouraged and be helped. All the things I mentioned just a little bit ago. You know, I think about that. Um, the, 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 the house of God is a place we can, we can live. In the first part it says it's a place for the unwanted. I mentioned the sparrow. The Bible says in Matthew 10 and verse 29. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? Not very much value. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Well, he knows all about them. In the house of the Lord, anyone can find acceptance. You know, Revelation twenty two seventeen says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Hey, the sparrow was worthless and unwanted, you might say. They arrived in great numbers as unwanted guests, uninvited guests. They came needy, looking for a place of shelter and looking for food. You can find yourself out in life today and these birds flying around a fast food restaurant trying to pick up anything they can find. They're trying to find uh, some nourishment, some shelter. That's what they do. They found what they came after too. What? I believe those little birds are a picture of the sinner. You know, uh, the sinner is invited to come to the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll stop there and make an interesting point. Um, I don't know how many times that I've been given a testimony by somebody, why well, I didn't feel like coming Sunday. I'm so glad I did. I got up and I didn't feel good and, you know, whatever the case may be. And uh, so I decided to come anyway and, well, Lord really blessed me. That's an example of what can happen. That's an example of what can happen. You know, um, those that have a need, those that need shelter, those that need food, there's plenty provision from the Lord for all. Uh, so it's a place for the unwanted. It's also a, a place of permanent dwelling. This verse says that the sparrow has found a house. The sparrow has found a house, a permanent place of residence. Hey, thank the Lord. Thank God the church is a place we can put down roots and dwell be a part of that. The Bible tells us to be unshakable and unmovable. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is on a vain in the Lord. You know, the idea of a house brings in mind a place that's comfortable, safe, a suitable dwelling. And that's what I found in the church found my crowd, found my place, found my people, the church. The church isn't pews. Church isn't this here, not the carpet or the walls. The church is you. And the church comes together and meets. And I love the church. I hope you love the church. I hope you love the church. You know, it's also a place for the pilgrim. While the sparrow is more of a permanent resident, the swallow is a pilgrim, you might say. He flies away um, in the fall and returns in the spring. He's a wanderer. Yet the tabernacle, 
in the tabernacle, the pilgrim swallow found a place of safety and shelter in the midst of his journeys. Aren't you glad you got a place to go to when things maybe aren't the way they ought to be, when you maybe wander a little bit? Note the word he says here concerning the swallow, and the swallow a nest. It says the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest. It gives the idea of something temporary. <laughs> what a blessing. The church is a great gift from the Lord, but we're not going to need it forever. One day I'm going to dwell with Him forever and ever and ever. So in some ways you might say, this is just a nest for right now. I'm not going to need it forever. I'm going to go to our eternal home one day in the heavens. It's also a place for the young. Look what it says in verse 3, where she may lay her young. Wow. The Bible tells us the swallows found a place to raise her little ones. To raise her little ones. What an application there. What a lesson for us. The church is the place to raise children. I've talked to many who have a great desire. They maybe not be faithful to church themselves, but they want to raise their kids in church. The best way to do that is come to church. Bring them to church. Start out right. Start out in a way that will bring honor and glory to the Lord. I don't know about you, but one of the greatest desires that I had for my children is that they would come to know the Lord and serve Him. How do you do that? You bring them to church. Be consistent. Teach, pray, and pray. And did I mention pray? And pray that God would bless well, it's a place for the young. In the church, they're raised in, in, in an environment. I think about uh, some of the Sunday school teachers that my children have had that have made a big influence on their life. Well, I'm thankful for that. The church. You know, um, when they're raised in the right atmosphere at the church, with the right example at home, they will usually find their way back. Now, I know there's exceptions and things happen. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 says, My son, keep thy father's commandments and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the ways of life. Hey, that ought to make us when I have the right kind of church. And as I read that passage, that's not the text for this evening. But I think about that. My son, keep thy father's commandments. Here's the thing we need to be careful about as parents that have children. Our children are watching us and we some magically want our children to do this and that that we don't do ourselves. Oh, parents, you got to love the church. If you don't love the church, it'll be difficult for the children to love the church. Oh, it's a place for the young. It's a place for the young. I want Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church to be a place where the Word of God is honored and the, the will of God is sought and, and it's practiced. The power of God is on display and the praises of God are heard. That's one of the things we get to enjoy as we assemble here together is, well, I tell you, I love testimonies. I love it when God's people sing. It's a blessing. I say this often, and I, I believe it's true. I, I'm thankful for special music. I enjoy it, and I love it, and I'm, I'm thankful that I get to sit and listen to it. But they're singing praises to the Lord. What a time to be able to worship Him. It says, also it mentions the nest. It's a place for the weary. That word nest implies a place of rest. I think the church in many ways is a place of rest. 
Now, I know with our technology, if we're not careful, we'll sit in these pews or we'll sit at home right now and our technology is disturbing our rest. Our technology is disturbing what God has for us at this moment. But overall, the beauty of coming to a place like this is, well, I tell you what, you don't have to fight the battles you fight at work. You don't have to fight the battles you fight out there in this world. You can come in here and focus your attention, prepare your your heart for the things of God and worship Him and find rest for your soul. Wow. We all need a place. We use the word, man, I just, I just, I just need a day I can chill. I just need a day that I don't have to like dwell on thoughts of all that's going on. I can just unwind. Hey, listen, the church ought to be that, a place we can come and rest in the Lord, think about all He's done, and give Him praise and honor and glory. It's a place for the weary. I was thinking about this, you know, two birds are mentioned here, the sparrow and the swallow, but there's a lot of other birds that could have been mentioned, but they're not. I got some examples here. I think about the eagle. He's too ambitious. The vulture, he's too foul. The hawk, he's too warlike. The barnyard fowl, uh, they're too dependent on man. The owl, he's too fond of the darkness. The mockingbird, he's too filled with himself. However, the sparrow and the swallow are lowly and little. Lowly and little. They simply, um, I mean, they're aware of their needs. They're not filled with self. They're just thankful for the place they have in the tabernacle. So it is with the redeemed of God. I mentioned those. I mean, this is not a, this is not a place where people should be dependent upon man based on how well the teacher teaches or how well the preacher preaches, or how well the sound person runs the sound, or the, the video person the video. You know, we're dependent upon the Lord in this place. We're dependent upon Him. The hawk, too warlike. This is not a war zone. I know we're in spiritual battle out there, but this is a place we come and honor and worship Him. We don't need battles in the church house. The mockingbird, hey, we don't need anybody here that's filled up with himself that thinks they're all that. No. And I believe that's why the sparrow and the swallow was used in this passage. Well, it inspires delight, it inspires desire, it inspires devotion. And let's look at one more thing. We're going to look in verse 10 for this thought. It inspires duty. I like what the psalmist says here in verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Wow. You know, the church is a place that you can exercise the gifts that God's given you. Hey, there's a job for every believer. He saved us to serve Him, to bring honor and glory to His name. He established the church as, as, a, as a body of believers. We talked about that. We all have different parts, different responsibilities in the body. And the, re, the, the reason He has us congregate together in a local assembly that we can exercise that body and accomplish what He wants for the church to do. I say this with all caution. There's a crowd out there where you don't have to get a church to be a Christian. Really? Think about that thought. All that Christ has done for you, the plan He has laid out for His body, and you have a better plan than He does. I'd be careful with that type of mentality. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He has a plan. He's already laid out what He expects. 
James 2.18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. According to God's word, against popular opinion, but according to God's word, what's been manifest in me, the fact that I've trusted Christ, comes out and these things, this delight and this desire and this uh, devotion and this duty becomes a part of what Christ did in my life. Be careful the statements you make about the house of God. You see, when the Lord saved your soul, He gave you certain spiritual gifts. And we can find that in 1 Corinthians. I won't go there. Chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Uh, Matter of fact, He's given you gifts that I don't have. I mean, there's, there's many that can sing a lot better, preach a lot better, teach a lot better, do a lot of things a lot better than I can do it. But boy, when we all come together and work together, uh, boy, He can accomplish a lot. And that's really all He asks is that we do what He's entrusted us to do. I don't want a free ride in the church. I want to do the part that God's placed on my heart. Matter of fact, I want to do better at that. Um, There's so much more that could be done. I haven't arrived. There's much that the Lord's still showing and teaching me. But I want to honor Him and Lay up treasures in heaven. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither rust, uh, moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. You know, these are just a few things from a passage of Scripture uh, about our meeting together as a church family. Boy, I want to encourage you. If for some reason right now you're having a little trouble and you've been out of the congregation for a couple months now, uh, I'll tell you what, you need to think about what Christ established and fall in love with your church again. Let it dictate. Let it be your desire. Let let it be what you uh, long for. Let it be what inspires you. The house of God's a special place. A special place. And I look forward to all of us being back together again real soon. I hope you feel the same way. You know, um, if church doesn't hold an elevated place in your life, and in your heart, boy, won't you ask the Lord to speak to you? Won't you ask Him to? You know, maybe it used to mean something to you, and now it's kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Oh, let's love our church as we begin to regather little by little, depending on different people's health needs. And uh, as we begin to come back together, oh, listen, let's, let's come back uh, refreshed. And, and, and ready to accomplish what Christ wants us to do. And if you're lost this evening, all oh, call on Him. There's nothing like serving the Savior. There's no place like this, but there's no body, there's no person like the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to trust Him before it's eternally too late. We're going to have a word of prayer. And I, I call on Him. Call on Him. Lord, we love You. Thank you so much for your word and just this passage in Psalms 84. I pray that you'll help each one of us to be energized, enlisted, and and ready to congregate and to assemble and to worship you and shout our praises as we uh, begin to reassemble and have a refreshed return. Lord, maybe somebody who doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray they'll call on you this evening and ask you to forgive them of their sins and come in their heart and save them and believe that you're the only way to get to heaven. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. We do worship and lift you up. It's all because of you. You deserve all the praise. 
We thank you in Jesus' precious name. And amen. Thank you so much this evening for for tuning in and for at least for being in church the way we are needing to do at least right now. I hope you'll pray with me about reassembling in the coming weeks and bringing honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you until the next time.